Hey everybody, uh, it's Bust with Battles with Bust number 131, and today we're going to be doing battle with Bard Brom. And so, this is a, this is a fun one, this is a more casual one, uh, if you will. I feel like this is a pretty good one to get us back into the, the mix of the competitive landscape, and so this will give me a day to uh, get back to being really familiar with the meta after taking about a week off, uh, and I think we'll have some fun with this one. And so this reminds me uh, quite a bit uh, of actually playing Expedition. We used to see a lot of these... Uh, Poro snacks based expedition decks. I shouldn't say a lot. It was actually really tough to actually get the Brom to show up. Uh, but it was one of these kind of, you know, really powerful things that you could do in expedition. It looks like it's an aggro deck because you're trying to play uh, a bunch of units in the early game, but it's actually more of a uh, mid rangey style strategy that doesn't really pop off until you get to play a Poro snack or two. Uh, but as you know, Expedition has gone away, the times change, new cards come out and such. Uh, Bard is something that's actually uh, kind of interesting in this style of deck and, and his ability to get leveled up off of the Poro Snacks. And so if we say have uh, three Poros on the board, we drop the Poro Snacks to give them plus six uh, stats in total. Uh, it does, you know, quite a bit of work in terms of actually getting our Bard to level up. Uh, and then it also gives us some uh, relevant stats uh, since our units are pretty weak until we get the Poro snacks popping off. And so that's kind of, you know, the general idea here. There's, of course, some of the chime uh, strategies that work with Braum. Braum with a chime is pretty strong. Uh, Braum getting leveled up with Esmuth is pretty strong as well. Just any time you can give Braum a, a single point of attack, he really uh, ups his game in terms of strength. Uh, and then some of the last uh, minor things that we're playing with here are uh, Pack Mentality as our standard closer. You Expedition folks already knew about this, but <laughs> anyone that uh, hasn't played uh, Expedition or a limited format in the past uh, six months or so may have forgotten the, the use of Pack Mentality. This will end up being our uh, game closer. As we always talk about, you either need uh, overwhelm, elusive, or rallies to close out the games with these stat-based decks. We're a stat-based deck because we're playing Bard, and the overwhelm of choice here is going to be the pack mentality. Uh, otherwise, uh, we are trying to bring a fairly heavy flash freeze package to the game with the two three sisters uh, and the two flash freezes, just because uh, the the Bard Lowey decks are so prevalent right now, and the uh, the the Kaisa decks are so prevalent right now. Just having a singular turn to where you can uh, frostbite one of their units down gives you a, a big advantage in terms of stalling out the game. But that's it. That's what we're going to be doing battle with today. I've already uh, checked it out. We have paid the pay-to-win price. The only uh, non-premium cards that we're sporting here today are going to be uh, our champions and the Aurora Porealis, and so we're good to go. Let's get these battles started. Where you at, Poro Ice Cream? And so <laughs> that was, that was a, a thing to me, the, calling this the Poro Ice Cream. I... Uh, I did just get finished with some travels. We went down to uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma for a bit. And uh, there's a, a an ice cream place called Brahms. Like, <laughs> I don't know what the deal is. If, uh, if Brahm has some kind of... Um, uh, history to him, whether, whether that's, uh, you know, derived from uh, some kind of uh, Norwegian or Scandinavian or what have you style uh, thing, or if there was just somebody at Riot from like Texas or <laughs> the, the, the southern Midwest and uh, calling this Brahms. But yeah, Brahms ice cream and hamburgers or something. I saw like two or three of them uh, as we were out and about. <laughs> and so... He's, he's doing it. He's doing his thing out there. But, all right. How are we going to get this going? The the, the downside to the, the deck we've kind of assembled here is the only card draw that we have is going to be through our Poro Herder. Uh, and so we don't have a lot of great ways uh, to come in and just, like, draw a bunch of cards after our deck gets kind of stacked with chimes. So I didn't want to play him early, but he is good enough to just shut down the Boisterous Host. And now we're in a spot to where we can get a... Uh, a pretty relevant Poro snack. And so I'm just going to come in and drop down the Mighty Poro. And then on our next turn, uh, we're going to look to uh, Poro snacks to be big enough to take down some of these stronger plays. And so I, I think we're going to get them. I think we're going to boom them. <laughs> we're probably going to take down this Callista. Now, the, the thing to kind of watch out for here is we're not going to grow and be able to take down the Phantom Butler. But uh, oh, he's playing the combo deck, huh? But I, I, hopefully we can just, you know, boom them. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with just booming them. Sure. We'll take this one. 
And then we're going to try and interact with Callista on the next one. Where you at? Nom nom, motherfucker. <laughs> All right, so let's at least deal with the Callista. Uh, it's like we may need to just go ahead and block something. It doesn't feel super ideal, but maybe we can give it a turn. We do still have this Fable Poro in hand to maybe pick up some decent stats. Okay. He shouldn't be able to go over the top of us too much, as long as he doesn't have the combo. If you're not familiar with what they're trying to do, uh, they're they're going to use a combination of uh, Ruined Reckoner, that 6th cost hallowed unit that uh, when it attacks, uh, you get to resummon a unit. And then the idea is uh, you're resummoning these Ruined Reckoners that put the free attack card in your hand. You do the free attack with the hallowed unit and you just get into this cycle of, uh, of being able to kill things. All right, reasonable enough combat. He's going to have to put his 4-3 in front of something, probably the uh, little Poro down here to the left, but we're, we're starting to get some serious board over top of them. Okay. And if he leaves some little Poros around, we do have this Aurora Porealis in hand for the, uh, the additional Poro snacks. Looking good, though. Pretty, pretty uh, reasonable advantage on board. You all said, Bust, how are you going to do it today? <laughs> are, you, are you really hitting us with the Poros? You got it, my dude. And look at that, to get the concession right away. You didn't think the Poros could do it. <laughs> but they certainly can. I have to check out the old Brahms ice cream. I didn't go. We don't have it in Kansas City. I, I did get to try, uh, it's called Whataburger. It's like, I don't think anyone would really give a shit around here, but like Patrick Mahomes was so super hype about Whataburger that it's it's been huge. Like they've opened up, uh, they're, they're supposed to be opening up like 10 or 15 of them in Kansas City, but I think they've only opened like two or three or four up to this point. And it is like an absurdity every time one opens. They have to get like the sheriff or the highway patrol or whoever to come down and just direct traffic for like literally a week. Because people will like line up for miles to eat Whataburger <laughs> as soon as it came into town. I was like, this is insane. I'm not dealing with any of this to any degree. But uh, there were there were a bunch of them all over Tulsa. And so I was like, well, I'll go and uh, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a try. <laughs> and it was it was fine. Like the the way I kind of rated it and explained it to the family was, uh, you know, if like you're eating by yourself, uh, then then fine, go for it. Uh, it's probably going to be better than like a McDonald's or a Burger King or whatever your uh, drive through uh, burger joint of choice is. But it's like certainly not better than like a like a Five Guys or one of the places where you're spending more money. Uh, and then if you're just like with a gaggle of kids, right, if you're having to uh, uh, to deal with people wanting the. Uh, uh, the, the, the the cheap cheeseburger with no onions and then someone that wants the orange cheese and then someone else wants chicken nuggets or whatever and just just go to McDonald's like <laughs> it's not it's not worth the effort to uh, uh, to, to deal with all of that and so that, that was my take you know I'm sorry Patrick if uh, <laughs> if this was supposed to be the next big thing I hope it makes you millions upon more millions of dollars but uh, it wasn't it wasn't quite doing it for me. All right, this, this turn's just gonna have to be fine. We can't quite build up enough board here to, to be really excited about it. I'm not amped about our troll chant status. This is one of the spaces you'll find with these, uh, with these style of Poro decks to where if you don't draw Poro snacks, you're like really hurting. In an expedition, you really need a two. And I'm hoping that we're uh, kind of canceling out the need for two Poro snacks by playing all of the chimes. Uh, but we'll often find that our units just feel like a little bit too small. We're going to pop off the snacks next turn, though. Maybe. Maybe not. We're going to we probably need to troll chant this turn. There's no way he just passes. He's always attacking with at least the Abyssal Eye.
Interesting. Is he just like guaranteed to have the Mystic Shot in hand? Why would he hook this Mighty Poro? Okay. I mean, that's fine. It leaves us in a spot to next turn to where we can like burst off the Aurora Porealis and maybe get him. Hey, right, dude, is that it, main Kale? Surprised I'm able to call her Kale. I tend to get like Kaylee stuck in my head. <laughs> Every everyone knows what happens as soon as we play a Vigio or as soon as we play a uh, Emperor's Diaz. Uh, I'm I'm sure as soon as Kale is actually a real card, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have to struggle with it. But I I tend to. Uh, just get it stuck in my head that this is Kaylee, and that's from just playing team fight tactics, and kind of, kind of is what it is at this point. <laughs> I can't, I can't do anything about it. All right, here we go. We should hopefully be able to pop off this turn. It's like unfortunate in that we can't take huge advantage of this, right? We have these smaller units out here that are uh, not going to do that well in the uh, in the face of like a. Uh, a block, but I think we can start to just build up. Yeah, let's bring it. Takes me down to 10, pretty close to the lethal. The The downside is without a pack mentality, as we come to the, the next turn of blocking, He's just going to have a, uh, he's still just going to have a full board and we can't chunk the damage in. And so we only have the the single overwhelm unit here in the Mighty Poro. And so it's like we're probably going to have to hit on the Fabled uh, to be able to punch through enough damage to win this one. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I mean, we got uh, things like three sisters to maybe punch through. Uh, if we hit, like, wide by one unit, maybe we get to three sisters and tomb away the, uh, the, the blocker in front of our overwhelm. Get a kill that way. Stuff happens, you know. Patch poor robot has the impact. There's a point of damage. <laughs> easy, easy game. Okay, something's probably going to go a little bit wrong here. I mean, he knows we have the other Poro snack in hand. It still feels like he has a, um, a what you might call it, a, a a vile feast. I saw him mill away one of them, but it seems like his plan last turn was to vile feast this mighty Poro, and then we snacked through it. Now it seems like he he knows that we have the snacks, and he's going to try and mess with this a little bit. But I, I think, I mean, if this unit falls, we can still just fill out our board. Is this like 10, 12, whatever deep does? Who plays deep? Kais is the only deck in the format that plays deep. <laughs> Just accidentally. There you go. That makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, we're going to struggle to get out of this. We probably just got to play a flash freeze somewhere. Like, if we bring out here, yeah, we can flash freeze an Abyssal Eye, but really messes with our mana for the next turn. And then this is the, the space that I was worried about, right? Even if we get the, the completely wide board, we didn't kill anything on our last attack, so he's just going to have blockers either way. Him going deep just was completely irrelevant, right? He was going to kill us in two attacks anyways, uh, but we're going we're gonna to hurt now. So let's do this. Let's drop the plucky. We'll add in the fabled next turn, see if we can't hit some good stats, but I, I can't imagine we can win this without a without a pack mentality. And the, the pack mentality is relevant for him being deep now, but okay. GG. A 
did get to remember some good lessons about life. Uh, you know, when I, <laughs> I have some real hot tips for whenever you travel. Okay, we used to we used to travel extensively for Magic the Gathering, uh, and, and so some of it ties in with that. But you know, the first one we weren't we weren't there to play Magic. We're not just sitting in the convention center the whole time. Uh, but the, the number one rule, number one thing you got to do is you got to protect your feet. So don't try to go and travel and fucking flip flops, you dumb shit. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta go and put on a, a real pair of shoes. But then, since most of you are uh, in the uh, the male genitalia, you gotta you gotta protect your sack and stuff too. And so you gotta remember if you're not gonna just get like athletic underwear, you know this is the thing these days. <laughs> you're not you're not having to run around in the tidy whities that your mom's been buying you since you were in elementary school. You can actually upgrade your underwear, and uh, they they make some pretty interesting things these days. I go for the, if I'm just doing like gym stuff, I'll get the draw fit things, but they still have some kind of like meshy kind of thing, and at the end of the day, you aren't stuck with like a wad of just like sweaty cotton in your ass, and so go out and check out some of that technology <laughs> if you're not at least gonna gonna go for that. If you say, nah, bust, you don't know what you're talking about, I'm all about these tidy whities then at least go and get some gold bond or something, dude. Something to <laughs> something to take advantage of that sweat. You gotta you gotta get it out of there. And so that's you know piece of advice number one. <laughs> Protect your junk. You don't gotta be running around with old 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 sweaty cotton all up in your crevices. Let's see here. We'll save we'll save a bit more of this for you here in a little bit. Let's get back to this game. It's it's a little unfortunate here with our Braum. I think we're still kind of stuck just adding him to the board because we need to get something going. But like getting something going can't be like Esmeth into Troll Chant. That's just a little bit too slow. I think we need to get a full board of Overwhelms here. Put him in a spot to where he doesn't really want to block our stuff. Uh, and maybe we can have something looking good for our next attack. So it's like we got to be like this. We can get these in. If he still wants to put a 1-3 in front of our bird, it's okay. Recalls are fine. Uh, ideally, we would have gotten a blocker out of this. Okay, he's gotten a ton of recalls. He hasn't dropped the Ari yet, though. Not 100% worried, but if he drops a board full of elusives, there's not really anything we can do about it outside of, like, flash freezing or blocking with Esmeth. How far is she... Okay, let's just make sure we keep Troll Chant mana here. Uh, Poro Herder's fine. Proto Poro will be fine as well. We want to be able to take away Ari's attack, so her quick attack thing doesn't work. Well, I guess I guess it's gonna work because of the the um, uh, because of the Esmuth, but we can hit the unit to her right as well. I think we should be able to get through this. We're not like we're definitely not dying this turn. Do they need our help? Walk softly, strike quickly. But yeah, I, I I can't envision a world where saving mana for three sisters this turn was going to be good. Poro snacks would be pretty good here. I definitely, uh, I definitely concede that. We want to get anything else down, like just, just get another overwhelm unit. We're gonna like run out of mana next turn, but probably just need to preemptively be ready for a uh, a, a snack to show up. Hit the hit the Porealis is just a little bit too slow. We give it one of these. We lose Esmuth in the process. Maybe we just shouldn't attack with Esmuth so we can block with him next turn. 
The rest of his blocks here look kind of turdy. I mean, we do have access to three sisters, but I'm really kind of planning on three sisters troll chanting next turn. Didn't present a lethal though. It's kind of kind of problematic. But. All right. No, I think we just overwrite uh, this Poro herder with Esmuth. All right. Hopefully that's enough. the The thing to watch out for here is like. We, we can be in kind of a spot, right? We we need to shut down this Ari, and uh, there's there's two ways to do it, right? You can either Entomb Ari, or you can uh, Flash Freezer. Uh, flash Freeze gets kind of counterspelled by Twin Disciplines, to whereas the uh, the Three Sisters Entomb gets counterspelled by a, um, a, a Deny. And let's see how he spends his mana here. I'm kind of leaning towards just going for uh, the Entomb plan. Like, deny is all we're going to lose to. It's, it's fairly easy to just have the Twin Disciplines here. Let's see. So we got to start like that and bring in some of this damage prevention. Then we need to troll chant. So if we give you plus two, is Esmuth minus two? Did we oh, do we fuck this up? What happened? Okay, now we're <laughs> now we're at one. Okay. So we lose to a twin disciplines. Whatever. He had the deny. Good job. Okay. It's just I, I I don't know the exact numbers of cards that they're usually playing here, but I'm pretty sure Twin Disciplines is always a, a three of, and deny tends to be uh, a one or a two. I don't think people usually run around playing, uh, uh, playing multiple copies of deny, but I'm pretty confident they always play three copies of Twin Disciplines, and so... I stand by it. You got you got to pick one, right? If you're in that space to where uh, you you just can't beat a card, or you need to pick one and play around it, then then you just got to pick it and roll the dice. At least try and pick the one that they're you know least likely to have. <laughs> so uh, if he has the the twin disciplines there, then you know we're beat. I guess probably just losing to either of them there, but. Fair enough. And this is going to be something weird with Tom Kench Ash. I think we can keep hands like this. It's like I'd rather have a little bit more Poro stuff going with it, though. Maybe we need to... It's like... The the cards like Poro Herder just don't feel like they're doing it for me. I think we have to hang on to Protos. Just to have the... Uh, the, the starts. But... Maybe we do. Maybe we just like Mulligan for... It's like such a a, a, a downgrade to the deck. To just be like, yeah, Maybe we just Mulligan for all the Bard cards. Because <laughs> the, the Poros are no good. See, this is, a, this is how you get a good start, right? You just pick up all of the Bard cards. <laughs> what a joke. Alright. Next turn. We're, we're probably just going to open attack... Things like the proto were just going to be too small. Wouldn't be surprised to see him take it. Like usually, if you're you're playing a deck with Starlet Seer, Starlet Seer is pretty important to you. But this is fine. Trading a troll chant for bird. All right. So travel tip number two. We already told you. Protect your junk and protect your feet. <laughs> oh shit! Cause he's just gonna kill our Brom like this. That was. Oh, he doesn't have a. He doesn't have the thing yet. I was like, oh shit, that's not. That's not good. Um, this is tough. I mean, I, I think I'm okay with it if he. 
just kind of like picks and chooses who he wants to hit with the acquired taste. Then we'll still get a good attack either way between either Bard or Braum. I think when he's, this counts as a strike, so we should get a Poro out of this, right? No? It strikes him. Oh, so we strike Tom Kench. He doesn't strike us. Okay. Another thing, too, always highly recommend uh, protecting your bowels as well. It's all about protection, right? <laughs> you got you to gotta get that, that Pepto-Bismol with you. You got to get those Tums. Maybe you youngsters don't have to do that, but whenever you go out and then you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go, go eat some hot chicken because that sounds good. And then you got gastrointestinal distress the rest of the day. <laughs> you got you to gotta protect against that stuff. So we did. I made it a okay. I, I did get some hot chicken. One of the, one of the the recommended place in the land of Tulsa was to get a, uh, was to get some hot chicken, and we we did. I protected. A little bit of distress the following day, but not uh, <laughs> not anything unreasonable. Look at this, look at this. We can pop this bard up a up a plus six. Sure. So how are we gonna handle this Tom Kench? This is good. This is where it's starting to be a little bit problematic. Uh, I think we probably just want to entomb him. So we can go with what the fuck is this so big for? Oh the the stats all went on the same unit, huh? So if we were wanting to spend like the six mana on the three sisters for Tom Kench. Well, we're just going to have to go for it now. Do we get our cards back like this? Like, the whole point of this play was to get our cards back, and now I'm pretty sure we don't get our cards back. This is like the the inception of capturing, right? Ah, oh, we got our guys back. Okay. So we don't get to Poro Snack this turn. We get to start doing it next turn, but... Yeah, that's fine. We can throw some damage into these Starlit Seers. It's not... Uh, not critical. Prime Fang Wolf. I don't, I don't like how this is starting to look. Alright, let's just stop it there. He's going to be up to some kind of, like, frostbiting shenanigans. I'm, I don't want to be a part of that. We'll just take our Poro and call it a day. If he ever just passes it back, how much do we care? I think it's probably manageable. I think he's gonna do something. That's it? Just an Esmuth? Okay. I feel I feel pretty good about that. There it is, we did it. We did <laughs> the the Poro snack level up. You saw it here first. All right. Now, how big are we able to go this turn? This is kind of the the, the downside to this one. Oh, he doesn't get the acquired taste. Okay. Another way to level up your Brom, right? Or level up your Bard. This is the. Uh, the the path of champion special if you will <laughs> and getting to getting to play the pack mentality and level him up i think this is why the expeditions had to go you know everybody was wondering why uh, you know, why don't why don't you just put expedition into maintenance mode and then you don't have to worry about it anymore just like have somebody put together some buckets every once in a while and then you you're just good to go like, why would they completely take it out of the game? I assume that there was, like, quite a bit of work that went into things like the Runeterran champions like Bard. And it's just like, you, you just can't do it. 
it's just too much effort to uh to, to keep it up and running with uh uh, with, with like that Rune Terran champion thing, it made it made a lot of sense. Uh, now that we've seen it, but when it when it was actually happening, it it was kind of uh, kind of odd. A lot of why why are you doing this to me, bro? Why <laughs> why are you taking it away from us? All right, he's got one good block. The rest of these should be pretty abysmal. That was one good block wasn't even that good. All right, Poros, I believe in you. Now, the other thing I can't remember with Tom Kench is if he has zero attack, if he can still do his uh, thing. Like, I feel like there was a point in time when he wasn't able to do that. Uh, but I can't remember if that's, like, still the case. Right, if we want to come in and flash freeze Tom Kench, I just I don't think we even care. You fought valiantly, Bard. Let's just like play the Aurora Porealis and pick up uh, additional Poros, and then we'll have like four Poro snacks so we can play some more next turn as well. I don't, I don't think this is too upsetting. It's it's like pretty tempting to actually come in and just overwrite Brom, uh, but. Stick with it. Are we just gonna be dead here because we're being cute? <laughs> is that, is that a, a possibility? He won't have his his crystal arrow until next turn. He can maybe frostbite something, but I I think we'll be okay. All right, we're gonna play four snacks. I'm gonna go ahead and start the emotes. Yeah, we have to at least like save. One. Right, <laughs> if he comes in and starts playing uh, Harsh Winds, then we want to be boosting our units after the fact. Alright, fine. Fine, dude. Play your Flash Freezes. Mm -hmm. I guess we could have gotten around Brittle Steels, right? But it's just the single unit here, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, that's a, a pretty hefty flash freeze. No, oh, we didn't even need it. He's still dead. <laughs> okay. Go us. Good job, team. Whew. But man, one of the things the, the travels did remind me of was uh, the, the way we kind of picked this. It's so weird out here in Kansas City and that uh, we just kind of looked at like the places within a four hour circle around. And it's like the places you usually just go to are going to be like uh, St. Louis. That's like the only big city within like the, the four hour circle. And then there's like smaller shit that nobody gets excited about, like Tulsa, <laughs> like your your Des Moines and your. Uh, your Wichita's and stuff. I think it's actually kind of interesting to go to places like that. Uh, it's not uh, super sexy to say that you went to, uh, you went on on vacation to, to Tulsa or to Des Moines or uh, whatever these kind of like mid-major cities are. But uh, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, it's a it's, it's a metro of a million people. It's a it's pretty uh, large and substantial. Whether or not you want to give it credit, but. Uh, it's like I fought back on my times uh, playing Magic. Like, I didn't realize how good we get it. You just assume that you're in West Virginia, everything is shitty, uh, which is, you know, not uh, an entirely inaccurate assessment of the area. <laughs> but, um, like, in, in terms of being, uh, like, a, a competitive live, live action magician, uh, you would, you know, typically want to be somewhere up in the northeast right you want to be in the uh god fucking cats 
in the, the the New Yorks and the Bostons and the you know the 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 East Coast area, uh, just given that the, there's just so much you know more density of people, right? If you want to play uh, a pro tour qualifier every weekend, uh, then you know you're you're pretty set to do it up in that space. You can probably travel like three or four hours. You can probably take uh, trains to a lot of it. Uh, it's just very well set up. And and you didn't like appreciate that in West Virginia, but like for the most part, if you were looking to say like either play a PTQ, a Grand Prix, or a Star City Open every weekend, you could do that outside of the uh, the the downtimes. Right, it's Christmas time, things aren't there. It gets to being like the end of a set, things aren't there. But during like the the big times of the sets, there was like literally something every week, and so. Like you, like with the the central place of, of Huntington, West Virginia, where I was from, you could go to Ohio. Like if you wanted to drive five hours in Ohio, uh, you could get up to Detroit. Uh, Detroit's in Michigan, but that's essentially the same place. <laughs> but uh, Cleveland was the other one. Uh, within like three hours, you would have Cincinnati and Columbus. If you want to go to Kentucky, there would be Louisville and there would be uh, Lexington. Uh, over to uh, the Roanoke area is where... Uh, Star City Games was they were either in Roanoke or Richmond but you had both of those Pittsburgh was like four hours away uh, and then if you're willing to travel a little bit further you could go to like Nashville's and Knoxville's and Atlanta's uh, and so it, it like it doesn't really sound like a, a spectacular place uh, uh, in terms of finding a lot of competitive Magic the Gathering but uh, it was most certainly there and uh, it's like now being out here in Kansas City it's like oh you got St. Louis like end of story and so it was like it was just so weird having a, uh not not realizing what you have until it's gone like i don't really have much desire to play uh competitive live magic the gathering anymore but um it was a it was a it was a good scene there's a, a lot of really strong competitive players there still as well so if you're one of those one of those young folks we usually just got a bunch of boomers out here watching this stuff but <laughs> if you're if you're one of those young folks looking for somewhere to go to college it's not a it's not a bad place looking in the ohio valley uh, and if, if not specifically uh marshall then places in columbus or cincinnati your lexington's your louisville's uh, lots of uh strong competitive magic the gathering out of that area But we just boomed this guy with the with the Poro snacks, and now we've hit uh, we've hit the life steal on the plunder Poro. I, I think this game's just done. We have the flash freezes for Tybalak here, as we love to say in this channel. I can't imagine losing this game. <laughs> I can't imagine it. Here, Rex, son. He says, oh shit, bust. He says, he says, I could tell you got that Ohio Valley spirit in you. <laughs> Just out here crushing. Alright, we're not going to give him the chance to play stuns. So uh, let's try and get an extra point in with Esmeth this round. He's going to attack. We'll pull Jen out to the side. This is going to leave his smallest health units here to deal with our mighty Poro. Uh, and then we can make three sisters plays however we need to. Wrecked. GG Brom cards. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. But yeah, man. Speaking of the of, of the magics like that, it's weird. The the places that get good. Like I don't I don't know how uh, the the things actually come together uh, in terms of having like the good communities. If it's just the, the the like one or two really strong people that drive it, or how it goes. But uh, when, whenever you hear words like Pittsburgh, there was the uh, the Carnegie Mellon people. They're all at uh, they're, they're all at Wizards now, but they were uh, a large proponent of. Uh, the the early game pro tour scene, you, there's I assume there's still just a massive scene uh, in Madison up in Wisconsin, and then I even think like the, the the Channel Fireball people. I don't think Channel Fireball is in like Los Angeles or the big ones. I'm pretty sure it's in San Jose, which is granted large, but uh, 
it, it's not like these uh, big, uh, you know, top ten cities in population that are uh, getting all of the uh, all the competitive merits, if you will. All right, let's get these stats on board. I'm never a huge fan of playing against Nami Twisted Fate. Uh, they do have lots of answers to what we're trying to do in terms of AoEs, but ooh, bird, that's scary. Glad we don't have to deal with Challenger Bird this turn. But um, hopefully the the Poro Snacks can help carry us through here. Like if he starts dropping Twisted Fates on us, I'm surprised to see the bird attacking. So he's got he's about to have options with the bird to hook down Esmuths, and so okay, changed his mind. I'm just going to, uh, depending on what we draw, I'm looking to just start building up the Mighty Poro. Yeah, we did actually hit on the Affectionate, so we could give the Affectionate the plus one, plus one from Esmuth and then challenge down the Fleet Feather, but uh, I don't feel like that directs us towards winning the game. I feel like uh, making value plays against Nami Twisted Fate just isn't the way to do it. Uh, we probably need to be uh, just just outright winning the game as fast as we can. And getting these big overwhelm units is your kind of your only way to take them down, right? They're going to play a bunch of shitty cards like Otterpus and Double Troubles and everything and just have this completely full board that uh, we can't attack through. So I feel like leveling up the Mighty is probably fairly strong. Uh, getting in a spot to where we can play the Fabled Poro and maybe hit another Overwhelm or hit another uh, Elusive, uh, another uh, potential for goodness, if you will. Hit on Braum. It's not I'm not excited about it. it. He does give us the opportunity to pick up another Overwhelm, but it's not really like carrying out the strategy of how we're going to win this game. <laughs> so I'm leaning towards like, uh, I think we just have to give up on Esmuth at this point. Like, I, I get that we have... Hmm. I didn't want to. I didn't want to reveal our trap card until next turn, but we can't be losing poros here. But right, I don't feel like just troll chanting to protect Esmuth is going to be the way to go. I want to get the proto down, the fabled down, and then see if we can't get something strong going. Fucking a. This is the easiest plus two cost prank in the world, my dude. <laughs> just just go ahead and click it. It's not that tough. There you go. Holy shit, he's bringing in the rest of his team? Why would you ever do that? <laughs> okay, maybe that was a mobile mishap or something. It was like, that was uh, arguably the worst attack of 2022. <laughs> All right, more Poro Snacks online. Uh, I don't think we're going to use it this turn, though. I think now that we lost out on the Fabled, we'll play the Proto, we'll play the Braum. We'll try and attack down as much of his board as we can, and then we can cycle around to have this Fabled on turn 6, and then an Open with Combat Tricks on turn 7. This is another thing. I, I feel like... Uh, no no hate to opponent here, but I, I feel like when you queue into Nami Twisted Fate and uh, and normals, you're you're probably gonna be in a reasonable spot. It's a a fairly difficult deck to pilot. And uh, I don't I don't think there's too many situations to where you're you're going into turn six with your Nami only being at two of eight level up. And you're feeling good about it. I don't. I, I, don't, I just don't mean to talk trash about opponent here, but I feel like there's a a really strong chance that they aren't playing optimally. All right, let's continue on. We'll we'll still try and take down this challenger bird. Uh, let's protect our little bros here. You know, we want to see them get the stats and stuff. Maybe we'll get a, a crushing blow on the next turn. 
or Poro Snacks. God, that feels good. <laughs> feels good, man. I don't think we can play the Fabled until next turn, though. We'll, we'll see how this shakes out. Just a red card. We can just Troll Chant here instead of dropping the Snacks, but I feel like we have enough... Uh, we, we have enough to just pull it off. All right, so I have to assume he's not able to attack now uh, with the with the Braum hitting the board. It, it sucks next turn to, like, drop a Fabled and not be able to Troll Chant, but I, I think it's okay. You gotta get these stats on board and get this thing cleared out. What was this? I missed what I missed what came out of that. Is a one mana manifest? Purple fish generated something, and that's what's happening now. Oh, face sprout. Okay. Sure. See, just like as we play against this deck, it's like, did you really need to face sprout right here when you could have just banked that mana into next turn to level up your Nami a little bit? It's like I I, I feel like we're uh, we're getting a little bit of help. But all right, what did we hit? Elusive on our 4-2, that's great. Uh, we have a Challenger Tough Poro, that's fine. We're going to have to... Oh, he's playing Shell Folk. No, we have to kill the Shell Folk. We're not going to be able to lethal this turn anyways. Okay, then don't be confused by the shinies on here. <laughs> our, our Mighty and our Fabled both have Spell Shield. They don't have Elusive. Just our 4-2 Jubilant has Elusive. So. so we get some more board clears here. Again, we have to lose our Fabled, or our, our, our one Poro, which is a little unfortunate, but... Kind of close to lethal next turn with our two Overwhelms. Might just play the proto as well. Well, uh, <laughs> I intended to play Brom. Like Brom's probably coming down. It's like, do we actually want to overwrite one of these units with the proto just to make sure we get the impact? And I, I could see it. I could definitely see just overriding Brom. He does let us like hook stats out of combat. The the Brom does, but he's uh, uh, opponent doesn't really have enough stats to interact with our uh, overwhelms. Alright, so he's playing a bunch of spells, but he doesn't have any elusives. I don't quite think we care about this. Yeah, I think I'm gonna come in. It's it's tough, right? If we, like, overwrite Braum, uh, then he does get to block our our mighties with big things and so it's like if we get to hook a nami out of combat do we deal less damage that way i guess we would be hooking the coral creatures out of combat but okay maybe we should have just overwritten the the bard well <laughs> if we're just gonna hit aurora porealis we should have attacked first but I know what I'm about. <laughs> All right, enjoy. What is that? Is that the, the manifest out of my hand? Manifest the non-champion card. So the best he can pick up from us is Troll Chant. I don't feel like this is going to be one for us to worry about. Alright, did we do it? Sean, I'm sure. 
think we did it. Market a W for bust in the Poros. GG's, my dude. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't mean to, to talk too much trash about opponent there. It's just uh, whenever you see Nami Twisted Fate turn up, like, even when we're, like, hanging out in Masters, there's, like, a few specific people uh, that, you know, I, I worry about seeing play it. And then there'll be another kind of group of people to where it's like, eh, they're, they're probably not going to be, like, doing terrible. <laughs> but it's it's at the end of the day, it's not one of the decks I, I super worry about playing against normals. You just, I, every time I encounter it in normals, you see a lot of that. A lot of the stuff like we just saw there as to where they they probably didn't uh, optimally spend their mana to, to really uh, maximize the things that Nami can do. All right, not a bad start, though. As we play more games, I feel like we have to just kind of keep our unit-boosting cards and then just let everything else fall as it does. And so uh, I wanted to hang on to the Poro Snacks was the big one out of that. I believe we'll get some, get some good usages out of it. It says, no thank you, I want to keep my codger. I wonder if that means he's got at least to have, like, a, a heal in hand or something. To heal and protect. So Rock is already here and ready to party. This is a fairly large Poro herder, but... Maybe we can cause, uh, cause Soraka some problems next turn. It's always weird with this, and like, you don't like have to block Soraka here. We can just kind of give this some time. This is going to let her heal next turn to where we could have just soaked up the damage and then taken the heal away from her. Uh, I have to play a, a lot of games against this dumb deck to know at which points I feel like it's okay. Here I think it's fine, since we're attacking with so many high-powered units. He's going to have to... Um, He's going to have to have, like, some kind of heal for her if he wants to block with her this turn. And then if he doesn't want to block with her, it's still kind of okay. Uh, right? He, if, he, if he blocks, he has to play some kind of expensive spell. If he's playing expensive spells, he's not building up his board. We're about to just get a ton of stats here. Okay, and then everybody needs to be big enough to kill Soraka again. Uh, I suspect he's going to have a Guiding Light, Pale Cascade, whatever. She's not going to die in this combat, but uh, the rest of his blocks are going to be pretty bad. Right? He can kill Bird. That's fine. He can put two units in front of Bird. That's okay. But the important thing here in our Poros aren't going to be going down. And then he's going to just lose a bunch of board. So I think this is okay. Interesting. He protects the Bird. Sure. Or protected his, his crusty codger. So we'll be big enough to take the, the codger down in combat next turn. We can Poro snack and block with a 4 4. Oof. Oof. There's a draw. I'll go ahead and block Soraka again. She's getting close to the heal, but uh, this leaves him in the same spot, right? He either can't use her, or he just throws her away, which is great for us, or he has to play, like, Astral Projection or whatever, a big combat trick to keep her alive. Uh, and all of that sounds pretty positive to me. Look at this. This is just going to be a big blowout turn, though. So my concern uh, coming out of this one would just be Hush. So I'm just going to boost our weakest unit at this point. I, I don't want to boost our uh, Mighty Poro with the Esmuth and then just have it get hushed. You are better than this. All right, it's a fairly important turn. I'm going to be struggling out of this. I don't care about the flip on Soraka so much as the... Uh, the Tom Kench surviving this. Go no further. Oh. 
No reason to troll chant. Okay. He should at least have... He should be struggling to Tom Kench this turn, right? He has to play a heal for two mana onto Tom Kench. I guess he does have a good target to hit in the Esmuth, but... Uh, as I say, it feels like our units should at least be safe. But playing playing this combat base strategy against uh, against Soraka is kind of meh, a little bit meh. Maybe old Fabled Poro will be enough for us. Sure. I keep looking at the Soraka like she's Star Spring, right? You get the, the Star Spring to just come in and close out the game. Oh boy, he just doesn't do anything? That's scary. Hmm. Not the greatest collection of combat stats. We picked up a Impact. No, you already had Impact. We didn't pick up anything super relevant. I guess Fearsome on the Nimble is something, but... Let's find out if this works. Why are we playing against so much Tom Kench today? <laughs> I don't think this stops it, right? Yeah, he still he still gets that swallow. So, uh, to, like, how much heal could they really have here, though? It's gonna have the. Uh, We gotta, we gotta put some damage in because of our overwhelms. It's like, is he gonna have a, uh... Like, star, star shaping and a guiding light? That would be like a six heal? Hmm. It does have three, yeah. Alright. Well, let's see. This kills him, we will win. <laughs> if this doesn't kill him, then we've probably lost. It's, it's pretty unfortunate that I'd rather just concede <laughs> if this attack doesn't get the kill, because the the game is essentially just over at this point. But we'll see. We could have. I don't know. I, I'm still not entirely sold on that last turn. Like, what keywords were we expecting to hit to uh, to turn that game into a winner? Maybe we should have just, like, let that turn pass, and then, uh, try to come in with the open. But it's just, like, it's such a weird spot to where it feels like they should be able to, uh, just, like, never die if they're willing to pass there, so... Hmm. All right. The final battle is upon us, though. Get to play against this Anivia deck. I'm sure this is going to be loads of fun. Some some chess-loving motherfucker up here. I, already, I can already tell how this guy spent his Friday night. It was A, by himself. B, Aster. All his friends asked him if he wanted to hang out. And he's like, no, I'm just going to play chess by myself. I got this really sweet Anivia deck. It's just chock full of every removal spell in the game and every card that says heal on it. You're going <laughs> to you're gonna love it. You're going to have so much fun today. I saw that the chess guy retired. I forget his name. My Carlson? Magnus Carlson? That's uh, that's always interesting to me, since it's like, he, he's young. Like, he was in his 30s, I think. Uh, and I don't really follow the world of chess. I just talk trash about it as I make videos. And uh, But I, I st I'm still aware that, <laughs> that, that Magnus Carlson is a person. Uh, and it... It just like, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know how it works with chess. If there's like a, a, a ceiling uh, in terms of, you know, you, you start to get old, and then, um, you know, you like you lose the edge. Like if you look at something like uh, League of Legends or whatever, uh, you know, there, there's nobody in their 30s. I know a lot of that has to do with, you know, being in your youth and then having wrist injuries and stuff, but. Um, you, you know that like he he could realistically have 
uh, years and years and years and years of competitive uh, chess ahead of him. I don't feel like it's a game as to where, you know, you you, you hit 25 and you're fucking ancient. <laughs> and so uh, I thought that, that was kind of strange to see that he was going to come out and retire. Uh, but it seemed like there were some kind of dramatics about how uh, the the upper echelon of players were selected and how they were allowed to uh, be selected for the, the big tournaments and stuff. So that game was dumb. Uh, just that doesn't count. That was, felt like a, a bad last game. Now, of course, matchmaking starts to break, and so <laughs> maybe maybe we should have just called it a day there, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm locked in now. We have to play one more. All right, try that again. We restarted it and everything. Looks like it's back in action. Let's see if we get to play against the guy doing, doing mono and Nivea. <laughs> LOL, watch me play removal spells. It's at least not as bad with darkness. I'll give him that. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, a, a darkness player, if he said, hey, man, you want to come play chess on Friday night? He's probably like, yeah, until until 9 o'clock. You know? <laughs> it's, not, it's not as bad. He says, yeah, come hang out. The sun comes, the sun goes down. I'm going home though. I say all right. Glad we, I'm glad we got some time with you, friend. <laughs> but the 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 dude bringing the the thirty removal spell Articuno deck, he's you give him that call. He says, Nah, nah, I'm just gonna stay home. <laughs> oh, this is kind of gross. Not having the unit to to get a shutdown here. I can't imagine we want to troll chant. We can at least like shut down a future strike with the troll chant, and so it doesn't feel as bad in those terms. Interesting, no block. It's like once he gets that second tick of darkness damage, then it can take down a 5 5. Now he's kind of given up on it and not. Not able to play a, a, a stronger darkness. He's only got three mana here. I don't think we'll be troll chanting this turn. Let's we'll just go ahead and drop in in the, in the mighty. Should shut down his attacks for the most part. And then next turn we, we look strong with the fabled and troll chants. Ooh, and the poro snacks. I think it can wait. What we hit? Regenerate and Fearsome. Beachhead, be free. I don't think there's a good reason to attack with the Fabled here. We can, like, he, he would just get this, like, straight block with the Robe Maker. I'm not particularly excited about it. Ooh, just a big boy vengeance, huh? Interesting. That feels like a fairly positive turn. I'm sad we had to lose our unit, but... Oh, boy. We just lost two chimes, though. Can't You can't love seeing that. And we have to snack. There's a, there's a very strong chance that he just doesn't attack this turn, and so can't pass with a million mana up. Ooh, this doesn't... Oh. Or we should actually do it like this, right? If we give guy over here plus two health, neg on the catalyzer, give this guy plus two health again, neg on the catalyzer, we take three. He doesn't get any darkness boosts, and then our, our units healed to full after this round. That seems positive. Now we have stronger attacks with the Fabled as well. He'll get the boost from Esmeth and be able to take down the Robe Maker. Ooh. Or the Poro Snack just shows up. Yeah, I mean, it's like... I, I think we're to the point to where if he has the Vengeance for our Mighty Poro, we would just look to Entomb it. Right, you can Entomb your own unit, right? Obliterate a unit. Yeah. Alright, we're getting close. Anything can be scattered to its elements, even us. A 
something still messed up with this? Uh, I've seen people... Uh, the, the patch notes came out and people started bitching about Extali Sentinels again. Is it supposed to lifesteal off of this darkness hit or something? I don't, I don't remember. People sure do love to complain when patch notes come out, though. <laughs> I will shape death as easily as clay. Yeah. Pick bird. Pick bird, shoot bird. <laughs> Not gonna do it, huh? Oh. Oh, he's gonna attack first? Okay. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna three sisters our fabled Poro. Uh, I I think we have to look towards uh, a flash freeze kill on this next turn. Like we're we're getting to the point to where we're gonna get boomed uh, if we don't win on this upcoming attack. Sure. And so I I think at least what's gonna be our saving grace here is um, he didn't play a vengeance last turn. And so if we can... Oh, that just looks so bad. If we can get a, uh, a Entomb on his blocker, or a Flash Freeze on his blocker, uh, we've got a decent chance of taking this down. They don't have a ton of ways to come out and try and drain two. I guess he would need to drain three. We get him? GG. All right. So yeah. Oh, 54 and four. That should count. Not a bad set of games. I'm glad we got a got an extra one in there against instead of <laughs> instead of finishing off with the uh, with the Articuno player. And so, anyways, not a, not a bad set of games. Again, I, I wasn't expecting this to be uh, the most competitive deck in the world, but it was uh, quite a load of fun to play. Uh, and there's, you know, always potentially something here. In terms of this deck itself, it's tough. Like. Um, it, it feels like in, in terms of like trying to play Poros, it almost has enough to to kind of pop off without doing dumb shit like just playing uh, the the uh, the elusive deck, <laughs> whatever that one was called. That was uh, a menace there for a bit. Uh, I don't think uh, that there's enough uh, Poros around to to really kind of like pop off with these things. Uh, but I think like Bard is still kind of interesting, right? Uh, Bard, he, he didn't play in here kind of spectacularly, but he still does enough to to be quite strong. And you know, whenever you're playing these decks and you're just like, oh, after I've played a few games, I feel like our strategy is just uh, just a mulligan for the Bard cards. <laughs> then you're just kind of like, well, why are we even playing these other things? But uh, the things that I kind of like look towards, at least with Bard and, uh, and mixing this together, is. Uh, you're, you're typically looking for, you know, some kind of way to get him boosted. Uh, the the Poro snacks are kind of an interesting approach to that. And if there are more Poros in the future, you can look to play cards like, uh, I, I can't remember it, Call of the Wild. It, it was actually like arguably the worst card ever made in terms of Expedition. It's that thing that costs like three or four mana. And you look at the top four cards of your deck and put all the Poros and all the Yetis and all of the whatever else is into your hand. Uh, that's something that I could see as being quite interesting in here. Uh, it just as the chance to uh, just have these gigantic Brom terms to where you're able to add two and three Poros loaded up with chimes to your hand all at once. Uh, and, and I definitely could see a world to where this is possible. But as we play a deck like this, like I was okay with Bard because the chime ability is so good. Brom was very underwhelming, even in the games when he hit on his chimes. Uh, and if we are looking towards a card like Call of the Wild, we just need more Poros to be printed. And so I wasn't super interested in playing like the five cost Poro that summons one when it attacks, uh, just like a little bit too expensive. We, we need to hit things like the cheaper ones. And so uh, if there ever comes a world where it's like we don't have to play Poro Herder, uh, and then we can just say cut out Braum and maybe get a little bit more Poro support, I could definitely see something like this being, you know, realistically strong. But uh, given the, the current state of the game and the current meta, uh, this isn't going to be a, you know, premier ladder grinder anytime soon. But it is going to be a pretty fun grinder uh, for the remainder of, remainder of time. And so, 
<laughs> I had a pretty good time with this one, and I hope you did as well. And so that is going to do it for us today. Hope everyone enjoyed the video. I hope you got your ice cream snacks a little bit better. Maybe learned a thing or two along the way and had a good time watching. Uh, this is Bust, and we thank you for being here. <laughs>